Synergy. Welcome to Synergy. Live with Synergy. Live with Synergy. This is your host, Andrea John Baptiste. Welcome to Synergy, where music, business, and culture synchronize. friends, family, colleagues, collaborators, audience, guests. Hello, 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 hello. I am Andrea John Baptiste, and this is Synergy, your new drive time favorite talk show where music, business, and culture synchronize. Yes. We're new to WDJY 99.1 FM, and we're excited to spend the next mm, 45 minutes, 50 minutes or so with you living in Synergy, live with Synergy, where music, business, culture synchronize. Today, today is another amazing day. We are on the horn, yes, pun intended, with the Derek Horn, and today's show is called Labels Are for Records. And before Mr. Horn joins us or, or, or starts sharing the, his valuable message, I want you to hear his intro from one of his albums, Black and Blue. And so I'm not going to read you a bio today, but I'm going to let the music, the message, play. So we should probably start out by saying that when I was a little kid, I couldn't read, I could, I could barely write, I couldn't spell. I got diagnosed as being neurologically impaired in the third grade, which landed me in a self-contained special education classroom. See, I was segregated while being educated. I'm one of the handful of African-American males that survived special ed. And eventually I, I made my way to college. When I was in college, I, at first I didn't know how to write a grammatically correct sentence. I couldn't use a comma but I was really fortunate that some folks realized my potential and helped me develop the gift that I'm gonna share with y'all right now. I was able to go on and get a degree in mathematics, a minor in fine art, start my own company, but I, I know that it's poetry poetry that has allowed me to inspire, challenge, educate, and inform. The Derek, so as you listen, welcome. What an amazing intro. And that's the intro from your album, Black and Blue. Welcome, welcome, welcome to today's edition of Synergy. Andrew, thank you so much for having me. Welcome, here. welcome. So, you know, as you informed us through that, or you edutained us, right, a combination of education and entertainment, you know, we know that alluded to a lot of the barriers that you've defied. You've surpassed labels, and you've proved impossibilities as possible. Tell us more. Get us into details about, you know, that diagnosis you talked about being neurologically impaired. Um, Talk about your abilities as well as those experiences um, during, you know, school. Well, yeah, I, um, as I said in the, in the intro, I was uh, first diagnosed in the third grade, uh, given this label of, of being neurologically impaired. Uh, later on in my life, it was uh, amended to having a, a learning disability. And it affects my ability to, to spell, to, um, uh, to comprehend uh, written speech, um, and also to do um, math. And uh, I, you know, I, I face a lot of challenges going through school, uh, going through special education. But uh, with the sort of having amazing parents and also some really awesome educators that uh, supported me along the way, I was able to graduate from high school. 
I went on to a local county college and was a part of a really great disability support program that taught me what it meant to have a learning disability. I started using accommodations, uh, things like extra time, taking my tests outside of the classroom, um, and support for my, for my spelling. And I think the, the, the big thing was that I had a, a great counselor uh, who told me to just stop worrying about the spelling and write. Um, you know, just go ahead and write, and uh, really took the gloves off for me, and I began writing my first poems. And um, yeah, I've been I've been at it ever since. I have two albums out now. Um, uh, I did very well in college. It took me seven years, three different schools, but I did graduate with honors from New Jersey City University. Um, I got a, actually a degree in mathematics, and I minored in wow. fine art. Yeah, I minored in fine art with an emphasis in painting. Um, and that's uh, yeah, that's kind of uh, you know the, the beginning of my journey. And I also, when I was in college, I started sharing my story um, of living with a learning disability, of thriving with a learning disability with uh, young people. And um, shortly after graduating, I began sort of the career that I'm on today. Amazing! So you divide all odds. I mean, with a great support system, um, you know, certainly proving again, that impossibilities are possibilities. And, you know, um, I also teach, and one of the things that I always tell my students is they sometimes say, you know, Professor, I've been doing this now, this degree for four years or six years or something, and I always say to them, do you know what? As an employer, I don't ask you how long it took you to complete your degree. I'm just excited that you have the degree, that you've gone through that process that helps you, you know, to be more skilled, to bring that and share that with my company and my clients. So it's really awesome to hear you say, you know what, it took me seven years, but I got it. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember being, oh, I don't know, maybe I was – 23 years old, 24 years old on campus, um, looking around at the uh, campus cafeteria one evening and seeing all these young 17, 18-year-old students and feeling like the old man on campus. And uh, so I gave a call to my mother, and she listened to me for a while, and she said, look, I was 35 years old, divorced, with two kids, working a full-time job, going to night school when I got my degree. Right. Mm. You're you're way ahead of the game. Stop complaining. Stop so, complaining. <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, Good job, also, Mama. Mm-hmm. There it is, right? And then also if you look at the stats, the, the sort of scary stats around um, students with learning disabilities, something like less than two percent of two percent of us actually graduate with uh with bachelor's degrees. Um wow. so only about ten ten percent of us will step foot on a college campus. Um, so for me to have gotten as far as I have and, and as far as I, I have gotten now, um, you know, really defying the, the, the odds. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it may be a race, but it certainly is not a sprint. You know, if anything, it's a mm. marathon. And so um, none of us really need to get caught up on the, on the time frame in which we uh, get our education, as long as we get our education. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. And, you know, just um, talk to us just a little bit. You mentioned using accommodations. And so one of the things that's always interesting and important, particularly, as, as I mentioned, as an employer, but also as we do some trainings with other employers, and we talk about reasonable accommodations because folks still get scared about employing people with disabilities, both cognitive and physical, um, you know, and mental disabilities because they hear that reasonable accommodations and they think, oh, my goodness, am I going to have to rehab my entire property or what does that take? But what what were some of the accommodations that helped you to um, pursue and attain your, um, your degree? So, you know, there were a handful of things that in hindsight, I would say we're actually very small. Um, and I graduated from high school in, in 1996. So the, the PC had at that point become commonplace. You know, we were all uh, connecting on the internet. But technology had really started ramping up, becoming a big part of people's lives. Um, so I can recall, you know, uh, struggling with writing and writing being ex- an experience that I'm very involved in. We we'll use uh, a word processing program, you know, Microsoft Word, and the little red line, 
um, to be able to, to recognize that I, I had trouble with spelling. Um, I also got comfortable uh, asking for help and not thinking that I just had to be able to do it all on my own. And so um, initially I would, I would uh, if I ever had to submit an essay or any work like that, show it to someone and have them read it out loud so that I could listen to it. Um, you know, uh, accommodations in school, like, like being able to take my test outside of the classroom because I get very, very easily distracted. And so, you know, just having the excess motion of a lot of people in the room, sometimes will um, uh, be an impairment in my test performance. Um, having extra time for a test, that's a big accommodation that you know, a lot of people with uh, learning disabilities need, just a little bit more time. Um, and so, you know, now, uh, you know, out here professionally on my own, I'm using uh, a lot of technology, you know, most of which, which is, is based on my mobile devices, you know, my, my iPhone in particular. Um, so a lot of speech to text, you know, my speaking vocabulary is a lot stronger than my written vocabulary. Um, and then also it's great that if I, either if I write something or if I'm trying to read something, which is maybe a bit more challenging, um, then I can just uh, do with translating, um, you know, text with my eyes. Um, you can highlight highlight text on the phone and just ask your phone to speak it out loud. A lot of my reading I'm doing with, uh, with audio books. And uh, so technology has been a really big game changer. Um, mm. I, also had challenge, I also have challenges around you know, what we refer to as executive functioning, so just knowing when to start and stop a task. So, you know, being able to utilize my calendar and setting alarms for myself and alerts uh, all helps me to stay really, really productive. Nice. Very, very nice. So, you know, you talked about the fact that a professor told you stop thinking about the words or the spelling and the grammar and just write. So that means that, I, or at least I'm surmising, that that writing, that poetry, that spoken word, was it's kind of always been in you or been, been there early on. What evoked that interest? What sparked that fire, that flame for you? Yeah, I've, I've always poet, and you know, even um, from a very young age, I can remember just being very excited about hearing dialogue that was delivered well. You know, like the speech was just ear candy. And as a young boy, my uh, mother had uh, an original uh, uh, first release of the Last Poets, and so she used to play that for me. And mm. um, Gil, Gil Scott Heron, you know, records. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my, my father just, you know, he loves singer-songwriters. I'm actually sitting in my house now looking at his, uh, his record collection and a, and, and a bunch of crates in my living room. Um, and so it was a, a common tradition for me to just sort of listen to, to all these really good lyricists. Um, so I think that, that uh, enjoying language delivered well has, has always been in me. Um, and then growing up in, in special ed, there's a lot of MCs, like guys want to be rappers. And um, I kind of realized that I, I didn't have the mental dexterity, at least not at the time, to be able to freestyle and, and do that sort of stuff. But it really was, it really was my counselor, you know, um, really just sort of priming me to write essays, you know. Um, you know, your sort of standard five-paragraph essay. Um, who, who said, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're not really – doing all that you can here because you're, you're holding yourself back because you're just worried about spelling every word right. Just, like, stop worrying about that. And just, just, just let the, the ideas flow out of you. And, um, you know, doing that and then also uh, having to take remedial classes because my skills were so low coming out of high school and, and in a remedial writing course, getting a really strong grasp of, of grammar, um, yeah, it just you know, it's just all the excuses for not not expressing myself with the written word. They just slowly began to drop away, and um, you know, I began waking up in the middle of the night, just filling page after page with uh, with poetry. Um, mm-hmm. And and then I I also remember going to my counselor Susan and showing her you know the stack of papers after several weeks of this, and um, her her helping me find my first open mic. So I got up on the stage and I read my first poems and people clapped and I felt good. So I said, all right, I'm going to do this some more. And um, that, was, that was sort of the beginning of it for me. Wow, you got the energy 
from the cloud, and you got the synergy. I love it. I love it. I love it. What a great story. What a fantastic story. I tell you, you know, folks uh, uh, in social work and counseling salute to you because you can certainly make a difference, and that difference is certainly made here to, in, in this sharing with, uh, with Derek Horn. You're on the line today on 99.1 FM Atlanta, it is Synergy, and this is Andrea John Baptiste, and we're speaking with author, poet, spoken word poet um, who delivers language well, I love that phrase, um, Lederic. Horn. Lederic, you also, um, you're an entrepreneur, you know, and um, salute to you because as am I, and I know from personal experience that the journey is an interesting one. Um, ups, downs, topsy-turvy, turns around, um, risk, fair, and lots of freedom, gratitude, and in my experience, contentment. Tell us about your journey to sustain yourself solely through your craft. Well, it's um, it started out actually as me being uh, interested in real estate. Um, my, mm. my family used to build used to build houses, and so I was sort of groomed from a young age to be a to be a landlord, to be a real estate investor. And um, my grandfather and uncle used to um, own a construction company. I'm actually living now. And uh, in one of the homes that my my family built uh, back nice. in the seventies, yeah, nice. We bought we bought it and uh, renovated it uh, a few years back. Um, so 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 yeah. So there was sort of that early training, um, and I don't know. I, you know there are actually pretty strong statistics or, or, or uh, studies out there that have looked at the connection between folks with learning and attention issues and entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a a uh, study done uh, led by a lady named Logan out in London who looked at American entrepreneurs, and she found that I think I think the stat is some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 percent of American entrepreneurs are people with some sort of learning and attention issues, and uh, she she puts a lot of that on uh, a number of factors. Uh, one of which is that you know we think outside of the box. You know we tend to just look at problems and solving problems differently, and so that can uh, uh, set someone up to be able to look for opportunities in the market that maybe other people's are, people aren't seeing. Um, also, uh, a big part of what entrepreneurship is is about building teams. You know, and I'm uh, I am at my best when I can surround myself with people who are a lot better at specific tasks than I am. Um, and, Me too. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so. Um, you know, just, just, just having a lot of people to help keep me on task and help me to manifest whatever ideas that I have are, 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 are really important. Um, and then there's also something about uh, dealing with failure, uh, you know, well. Um, I've, I've pretty much gotten used to not getting it right the first time and, and you know, and having to uh, pick myself up after I fall down or something doesn't go well. And uh, that is just kind of a part of what it is to be an entrepreneur, you know. And so I've been very fortunate now, you know, to be able to sustain myself as an artist and as a, a consultant um, around improving the outcomes of, of people with disabilities. Um, and and yeah, I think it's been a, it's been a lifelong journey. I, there's also just a part of me that just wants to be in charge of my own destiny, and mm. um, and 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 you know that self determination piece, and just wanting to be very clear about. Um, setting my own value, um, and I and I am in in no way I, I don't have anything wrong with you know working a, a nine to five, and right. at some point in my life that that may actually become uh, an option for me. Um, I haven't necessarily ruled that out, but I, I, for the most part, I've never had a boss. Um, so, uh, and it, it feels pretty good. It feels pretty good. Amen, brother. I do. Well, yeah. unlike you, I got a couple of years on you, Lederick, but um, I've had a couple of bosses. And let me tell you, my favorite is the one that I have right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so do you think that this journey, I mean, you, you talked about the, which was great data and good information um, and a really wonderful and positive perspective on entrepreneurship for people or yeah, for people with disabilities um, and a, a different way. I mean, I love the fact that, you know, you mentioned the fact that it 
people with disabilities sometimes are very successful because they have a different way of looking at things and also yeah. their um, ability to perhaps um, bounce back, the resiliency, because quote unquote failure, you know, has not necessarily been fatal for them over the years, while folks that are maybe not having a disability, you know, one failure is seen as like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, the sky has fallen. So I think that's a great perspective. Do you think that your journey is significantly different um, because of your disability? Um, I think so. You know, I, I know that it's, um, I have to think that I would be a very different person if uh, if I didn't have the experience of, of having a learning disability, of passing through special education in my school district at the time at which I passed through it. Um, you know, with, yeah, with dealing with, with a lot of feelings of being adequate, of not being as smart and as good as everybody else. And and also feeling this in, innate urge to uh, to be better, you know, and that and that being a real real push that is uh, you know kept me going for uh, going after higher and higher goals throughout my life. So I think that it's it's definitely it's definitely shaped me to be who I am uh, who I am today. Um, now at the same time, I can say this is that in some way I've there's a lot of trauma uh, as, as a relate as a relate to having a learning disability in, in our society today, and uh, what I am committed to is making sure that uh, the the next generations growing up in the U.S. and around the world, whose bodies and minds work a little bit differently than everybody else, that they don't feel that same insecurity that they are given the supports that they need, and they know from from you know from a very early age those aren't necessarily. Um, an indication that they're not going to be able to contribute to society or have, you know, really remarkable lives. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely shaped me in who I am, and I think it's, it's put me on a, the trajectory that I am today. Awesome. Good stuff. And, you know, as you talk about students, and it sounds like you're well on your way to leaving a very strong legacy for uh, students, children, the next generation of people with disabilities, salute to you. There's so much work being done with with children, with students, as we know right now, about social emotional learning, you know, cell as they call it. What are your thoughts and do you think this will like make a difference in terms of how youth perceive themselves, particularly those, you know, that with disabilities, do you think it will help them in terms of how they perceive themselves, but also students that are that are um, in the general population, how they may perceive their differently abled peers. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think social will be more exciting initiatives that are focused in our today. Um, our young people need a lot of support around self-concept, around being able to regulate their emotions. And, and it's not even young people. I mean, adults, you know, a lot of adults need that support too. Um, and so at, a, at, at, at an early age, we can begin giving our young people those tools, um, helping them to be able to navigate through relationships, navigate through their own emotions, their own feelings. Um, I think it's very, very important. I'm on, I'm on the board of a nonprofit organization called Eye to Eye, and that's E Y E, E Y E, and um, we are uh, an art. We do art-based mentoring, a number of things, but our core programming is around art-based mentoring, and we really look at ourselves as being uh, an initiative which is really based in teaching the emotional learning skills that young people with learning and attention issues need to help have a better self-concept and just sort of navigate through through school and life. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I firmly believe, right, that um, our young people need mentors um, and they need uh, a host of tools around helping them to, to deal with the more emotional aspect of, of their lives. It's, it's, a, it's a, a piece that I think um, – I think it's been missing for for a long time in education, and um, and it's yeah, it's just really good to see see our our, our schools taking it more seriously today. Mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. As we take our break today on synergy, we are speaking with 
author, poet, consultant, Lederic Horn, on our show as we're speaking about abilities. We're talking about the fact that labels are only for records. They're not for people. So taking us to our break will be Lederic Horn, I Dream of America, from one of his albums, Rhyme and Reason. Rhyme, Reason, and Song. Last night I dreamt of what America could be, a land for the brave, a home for the free, a nation unlike any other where man and woe man are sister and brother, and we all live together and get along. It's the unity of a people that makes the nation strong. So, oh yeah, of course there was an abundance of unity because we were all created and treated equally and endowed by our created with certain inalienable rights. You should have seen the damn dream that I had last night. It was a capitalist economy, but we all got paid. And the government didn't take a tax out of the money that we made. In fact, the government was this efficient system that ran all night and day because there were no political parties to stand in its way. All the schools worked too, so the kids all got A's, and when they went away to college, there was no tuition to pay. We all lived in safe neighborhoods where the streets were clean. Sounded my alarm clock, ending this dream. I'm already upset because I know what the day has in store for me. You see, I love to dream the American dream. Yes, I love to dream America's dream, but I'm forced to live its reality. For the past 12 years, Axel Management Capabilities has helped individuals, businesses, and municipalities move from capability to actuality. Our team of experienced business developers will help you to start and grow your business. Let us help you create your business or strategic plan. We'll create with you a responsive marketing campaign that gets you results. How about a new look or a brand makeover? Need a grant written for your nonprofit? Or how about having a corporate event plan? Well, visit Axis HQ or call us at 954-742-9166 to get moving from capability to actuality. Axis Management Capabilities, your full-scale business development firm. All right, we are back on Synergy with Roderick Horn, 99.1 FM Atlanta, WDJY. Are you liking what you're hearing? Because we are having real talk about abilities today as we talk about labels being for records, not for individuals. We speak, we are on the line today with Roderick Horn, author, consultant, spoken word artist sharing with us his journey through and to entrepreneurship as an individual with who has been diagnosed quote unquote labeled with a neurological disorder and how he's made it through a story of hope of inspiration and hopefully of aspiration but Derek thank you so 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 much and you know our listeners just got a chance to they got a taste from black and blue earlier and they just got another taste from rhyme reason and song your CDs are absolutely fantastic tell us about that process how did that come about um, in terms of making this you know them come to to reality and fruition oh man the the uh... Well, thank you for the compliment, and I'm very proud of uh, both those albums. Um, the uh, when I was when I was initially going around throughout the, the tri-state area as a young writer, as a young poet, uh, it actually never occurred to me to try to seek out a record deal or to get someone to uh, you know to put me on any kind of label or do anything like that. Um, you know, I had a lot of friends who were, who were musicians and, uh, you know, and, and folks who had recording studios. And so it always seemed like around me there were enough of the pieces, right? Um, and I think, you know, uh, for better or worse, I've always had a, a do-it-myself uh, mentality. And so, um, yeah, I can remember the, the very first uh, poem I ever recorded is from the, the first album, Rhyme, Reason, and Song, and it's uh, the poem, Hand of God. 
And uh, my, my buddy, my friend um, and producer, Ty Gardner, had, had made a track, and he's um, really, really deep in the house music. Um, and, and he made a track, and he said, you know, I can hear your voice on it. So uh, I came in, and, and uh, we recorded this album. And then it, it was actually sort of just a side project that I worked on um, throughout the from sort of last few years of my, my time in college and shortly thereafter. Um, and, yeah, slowly, you know, I got enough together where I felt like I had an album which really reflected my work and also just kind of had a bit of atmosphere about, about my life. Um, and, yeah, just one piece after another, you know, just asking, you know, one independent art or or artist after another as I came across different challenges, you know, how do you get the CDs printed and where do you go to and, you know, and, and um, leaning on my buddies who were graphic designers and web designers and just putting all the pieces together. Um, and then once I got the first one done, it, it kind of felt easy thereafter. Um, the, the second album, um, you know, I, once I got enough work together that I felt proud about and that, that I wanted to share, um, I was able to, to produce that much, much faster um, because, I, I, you know, I had all the pieces together at that point. And, and I've even helped uh, other artists uh, with putting their, their work together, uh, just using the, the network that I've been able to establish in order to, uh, to, to publish my own work. Awesome. Wow. So you, you got project management by baptism by fire, it sounds like. It sounds like <laughs> you, you were successfully baptized and entered into the fold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, for, and fortunate, too. You know, like I, I'm sure, you yeah. know, not everybody's got that network, but just, um, you know, just kind of taking one step after another. I went to my first open mic. I remember the guy that organized that, uh, Freeman Walker, Brother Free. Free walked up to me afterwards and was like, "Look, this is the first time I'm doing this show. I want to know if you wanted to, you know, help me, you know, produce it, help me, help me put it on." I said yes, and my role was kind of like a entertainment director, you know, where I would call up all the artists that we wanted to come out to the show, and you know, it was just a confirmation, you know, will you come? Will you be there? And we only did it once a once a month. We were standing room only, and we had a great variety of artists. And I, you know, just kept building this this uh, phone list of of people from you know different backgrounds, different uh, art, art, forms of artistic expression, and uh, relied very heavily upon that list when it was time for me to you know find a guitar player or a piano player or someone to play the upright bass or the cello or you know to sing a few vocals or, or what have you. Um, and uh, we'd all develop friendships, so, you know, everyone seemed pretty eager to come in and, and help me out. Mm, blessed, 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 blessed. You created awesome synergy. Yep, you got your music, your business, and your culture synchronized. I love it, I love it, I love it. The technological advancements, you know, have impacted every industry, every sector, and you talked about the benefits of technology in terms of assisting with your executive functioning, um, your organization, and things of that nature. Anything that uh, technology has, you know, done to, in particular for your art, your craft, that you can think of? And you know what? What do you think is um, is it impacted? Is it helped? Hurt? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I yesterday was an interesting day. I sat in a board meeting in the evening for three hours, um, and also met with a team of people from throughout New New England um, to prepare for a webinar that I'm going to be doing on uh, October 24th. Um, uh, as part of a, a film called Intelligent Lives that I'm the head of uh, the youth engagement campaign for. Um, so I met with these, you know, with these different groups of people from all over the United States, and I did that all in my living room uh, yesterday, right? So the ability to, like, <laughs> to collaborate and to go to scale now is, is really remarkable, you know, just compared to, to what we had 10 years ago. Um, there are some downsides, you know, so I'm, I'm fortunate that I have enough of a following and a platform and I get asked to come out and speak at schools and at conferences and, you know, I spend a lot of time in the front of the room. And so I, I you know, I still like print up physical CDs and people will, will buy those and I sign them. Um, but I also have digital distri- distribution agreements in line with, uh, you know, like Amazon and, and, and um, iTunes, the iTunes uh, music store. 
And even just yeah, a decade ago, people used to buy entire albums. You would get an entire download. Um, people were still using the website to, to buy physical CDs. And now it's basically all streaming, and so it's just you know a fraction of a penny every time someone takes a listen to your work. Um, and so you know maybe the upside is you know I can look and I can see that I'm, I'm I have an audience that's you know from all over the world now um, instead of just you know the person that can kind of get your your printed up CD in their hands. Um, but it's changed the sort of economic that, the dimension to to being able to sell units. Um, you just have to think a bit more creatively. Um, you know, and, and it really means that, you know, you have to have a following where, you know, people want to bring you out live. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, t- technology has changed, you know, has changed, uh, you know, what it means to be an artist dramatically. The other, the other thing I can tell you is, um, you know, I'm working on my second book now. Um, I co-authored a book a couple of years ago with Margot Izzo um, called Empowering Students with Hidden Disabilities, A Path to Pride and Success. Um, and you know, wrote that primarily on my laptop. Um, this this next book, um, I I am moving so much, and um, speech to text has become so good that I'm doing a lot of the writing of this this second book just on my phone. Um, it's just an, an ongoing um, uh, note and collection of emails, draft emails um, that you know eventually will get pulled together on a laptop, and I'll have to clean it up, but. Um, there's just the writing process has changed a lot for me as well, um, given the, the the change in the tools um, because of technology. Wow, that's that's interesting. That's intriguing to hear. Um, so you're writing your next book on your phone. I think that's pretty pretty cool. Um, what's the trajectory for spoken word as an art? I mean, you know, I, I certainly, um, within the business and just personal, I'm meeting way more many, and many of them are very good um, spoken word artists and so on. Where do you see it going? What do you think is next in that industry, that genre, um, from your perspective? Well, I think um, – I think it's been really great to see how well Hamilton has been uh, received, and mm-hmm. and I and I think that spoken word as a sort of addition or variation on the musical ha- is is uh, really exciting, um, and so I think theatrically, um, you know, uh, it's it's I think it's being taken more seriously, and I think it's just another yeah. another uh, realm that we can we can move into and, and use it as a form of expression. Um, yeah, the, I, more than anything, what I, what I, what I hope is, is always true, and, and at least has been true in my work, is that um, spoken word, I think, has to have an element to it which is around um, pushing political change, you know, and, and, yeah. having, and having the people who listen to the work be empowered um, uh, as much, if not more, than they're they're entertained. You know, um, there was actually a time when I was just writing and not even going out and performing because it just kind of felt like everybody just wanted to show. You know, they just want to come to a show, go to a show. Um, and what what pulled me out of that was once I really seriously looked at um, the position that I had moved in as an advocate for people with disabilities. Um, I really saw that as being uh, an ideal place for me to bring my poetry to um, be a voice for that community, you know, a voice for folks that live experiences very similar to my own. Um, You know, I I think that all poets need to have a people and a place that they represent. And so um, I'm I'm, I'm from New Jersey. I'm very New Jersey. um, But I'm also I've also come through this space of being in special education. And um, and I wear a bunch of different hats. You know, I'm an African American male, um, and I'm also a person with a disability. And so I try in my work to be as true to all those different places and all those different people as I as I possibly can. Um, yeah, I I think you know spoken word is going to go wherever the people want it to go. Um, but I just I hope that uh, at its core that it's, that it's always about shedding light and providing more insight in the world around us so that people can, with that insight, make better decisions um, and just live better quality lives. Mm, good word. Well, funny how time flies when we're having fun. Our time is almost up. And so 
Well, Derek, I just have one last question for you. As you reflect on your life, particularly, you know, your formative years, what would you say now to that young man and maybe others like him? Mm. <laughs> well, if I'm speaking to, to, to myself from, you know, way back in the day when I was a young man, um, the one thing, the, the, there are a number of things that I would say. One is, is that you are not alone. I remember feeling very alone um, as if the challenges that I had were, were solely my own. Um, but I, that, you know, I know that I'm a part of a, I know now that I'm a part of an incredible community, um, a, an incredible uh, history of people who have helped to make the world a much better place. Um, I also would, would have said to myself, to my younger self, hey, man, there's this thing called the iPhone that's going to show up soon. And so, <laughs> you know, you, you actually are going to have a calculator in your pocket all the time, and you will be able to get help with your spelling all the time. Um, and so, you know, study hard, work hard, but, you know, a lot of these things you're stressing out about are going to be at your fingertips. You're going to get a lot of help uh, because of it. Um, and, and one of the things that I say to young people is, and it, it's very much in line with that piece that you're not alone, is that it's really important for all of us just to share our story, to share our truths. Um, uh, I have a learning disability, and so what it means is that I don't use a wheelchair, I don't have, um, I don't use a cane. So if people look at me, they can't necessarily see um, all the things that I've experienced and, what, and the help that I need. The only time it becomes visible is when I open my mouth up and start communicating, start sharing with people what my experience is. And so it's really important for young people now to just start uh, pulling away from feelings of shame and start embracing themselves, their identities, um, as people who learn differently, as people who have disabilities. And if it's something that is not apparent, please open your mouth up and start sharing your story with other people. Be that brave. Um, because I think you'd be amazed by how many of us there are that are out there that are just waiting to connect with each other. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much, Lederic. It has been a fantastic time, amazing sharings, great work. Thank you for the perspective, the positive energy. Um, as we have talked today on Synergy, where music, business, and culture synchronize. Uh, taking us out for this segment is Lederic Horn on, from his album, Black and Blue, and it is the, uh, the work Dare to Dream. Well, Derek, I thank you, thank you, thank you, and hope that you will stop by again and be a guest on Synergy um, in another couple of months or so, and we look forward to uh, all of your good work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dare to Dream. Thank you so much. We are gathered here today to bear witness, to bear witness to the union of two beautiful people. Yes, today is the day that we merge who you are with who you want to be, making the vision and the reality one. An integration born of communication and made tangible by your commitment to yourselves. Now I know some of you might be a little afraid, but don't let cold feet stop you from jumping the broom, from taking the first step, from beginning a journey that will transform your life. Yeah, I know some of you might be a little afraid, but you see, it's my job to show you that better days are coming. Yes, it's my job to be Harriet Tubman-like with my movements and verse. So if I have to steal away just for us to make a way, well then, star, my hand will be the first one in the cookie jar of self-advocacy. I'll use these sticky fingers to pickpocket the pocket of self-determination. And if I have to grand theft auto the Mercedes Benz of a quality education, well then they might as well leave the doors unlocked and the key in the ignition. Cause I'm gone in 60 seconds and ain't nothing, man. I mean, nothing gonna stand in my way. And so, I dare you. I dare you to sit out there and not feel moved by the testimony of this brave soul who has come before you as an example of excellence. Yes, I dare you. I dare you to look into the mirror without imagining 
See yourself as yourself, a diamond that might need a little bit of polishing, but whose beauty has always existed. Yes, I dare you. I dare you to step, bounce, and move to your own rhythm. Excite minds and time will redefine this system. I write lines designed to embrace and kiss, plus supercharged like imports strapped with nitrous. This is a revolution, a fight for inclusion. Segregation is no solution. Brown versus Ed is how I'm proven. We deserve the best. Nothing more and nothing less. Every child gets left behind when all we focus on are tests. And so I dare you. I dare you to judge yourselves by a different standard, to lift as you climb, and to fight like gladiators to become master and commander of your own beautiful minds. But above all else, I dare you to dream. Dare to dream, y'all. Michelle Montano and Alkaline performing live at BRT Weekend Miami, the world's biggest Caribbean music festival, now in Miami for the first time ever. November 2nd to November 4th at Virginia Key Beach Park. Three days, six all-inclusive events. Get your early bird tickets now at BRTWeekend.com. Headlining, Michelle Montano and El Yo, this is Marshall Montano, and I will be performing live at BRT Weekend. Yo, 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 yo. Oh, I don't know exactly, and I'm going to be at BRT Miami. Oh, now in Miami for the first time ever. November 2nd to November 4th at Virginia Key Beach Park. Three days, six all-inclusive events. Eat and drink free all weekend. Get your early bird tickets now at BRTWeekend.com. If our firstborn be a girl, let's name her Nina. Let's name her after the woman whose voice filled us, left hope on our doorstep, and made us want to be free. Our firstborn should have the name of a dreamer. May she speak in song and never weep. We'll hum her a love supreme lullaby and hang microphones from her gazebo. She will know that the dark is nothing to fear, no, nothing to fear. May her hair and eyes be as dark as the night sky she was conceived under. She will be kissed, held close to the truth, and in time she will want the freedom that her parents never knew or saw, but dreamt of as they whispered in the night. Let's embrace her like the sky. We'll wrap her in blue and bathe her in sunlight. Every day we will tell her she is beautiful. And every day we will show her she is beautiful. And as she grows, she will know that she is beautiful. No matter what the television says. Let's teach her to dissect the world with the sharp, sterile tools used by scientists. And having soap boxes glued to the soles of her shoes. May she speak of revolutions with a poet's rhythm. And every so often, let's place her at the center of the solar system so she might practice governing the bodies that revolve around her. Yes, if our firstborn be a girl, let's name her Nina. that 
that's our time. That's our chat. Now it's time to call it a wrap. Tune in next week at 5 for another episode of Synergy Live, where music, business, and culture synchronize. Until then, hit us up online at livewithsynergy.com. Synergy is a production of Black Iowa TV. Synergy is brought to you by Axum Management Capabilities www.axumhq.com. That's A X U M H Q.com.